Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, bringing another episode of Living the Wildlife, part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Thank you very much for stopping by. So let's talk a little bit about how to get a hold of me. You can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. That's wildlifecontrolconsultant, no S, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. Love to hear your ideas and response to the show. No sponsors today, so we're hoping we get some sponsors. If you're looking to become a sponsor of the Pesky Podcast, definitely reach out to me. And if you have story ideas, if you have topics, and Steve, this, this issue is really bugging me. I wish you would talk about it. I would be happy to hear your, your comments. I would love to get those from you, and we can schedule some future shows. And if you have a product, or you have a book, or you have a technique, or you have a an issue that's on your mind and you want to be interviewed on the pesky podcast, living the wildlife, uh, definitely reach out to me again. That is wildlife control consultant at gmail.com. All right, well, let's get right down to it. Let's talk about repellents. Yes. Repellents. It's the thing we all love to hate. Some of you may adore them. Some of you may hate them. Myself haven't been a big fan of repellents, but it's not me today wanting to talk about my bashing repellents per se. I want to talk about the theory and issues involved with repellents because a lot of times people don't understand how repellents work and don't work. And what happens is as a professional, you keep encountering people who say, I, I did this and it magically worked and, and they'll swear by it. And there is no amount of evidence that you can give them to say, otherwise we're just a, just down the road. Someone else will say, I tried that and it didn't work. So what, what's going on here? What is the problem? Why is it so difficult for us to talk about repellents in a responsible way? Why do they work for someone and not work for someone else? Well, it's complicated, right? And so I'm not trying to make things more complicated than they are. But the fact is, as part of the Pest Geek podcast, is we are geeky. We want to get down into the details as sort of citizen scientists to try to get beyond just simply anecdotal information get down to the hard truths, right? One, uh, I remember getting an email from someone in the past and they said, a simple lie is harder to believe than a complex truth. And I thought, yes, that is very true. And, and sometimes we're just inundated with so much information, it's hard for us to tease it out. Well, I hope to try to get some clarity and some categories to help you understand how to evaluate pet repellents and how to uh, think about them if you're going to be incorporating them into your service practice, whether you're pest control, wildlife control, let's, let's talk about this together. All right. So let's get right down. Let's get right down to it. So first let's deal with the definition of what is a repellent? What do we mean by a repellent? Well, a repellent is a chemical product that is irritating, noxious, or fear-invoking to a specific animal, species, or group of species. So, sort of rephrase that, a repellent is a chemical product that causes a a reaction of horror or avoidance or flight from that substance in a particular animal or a species of animal or a collection of species of animals. All right. Now this makes it different. Why am I getting so technical on this? Because we want to separate repellents from frightening devices. Frightening devices are non-chemical. Okay, so when you're using pyrotechnics, when you're using lasers, when you're using an effigy, when you're using, uh, you know, bangers, those are not pesticides. Those are, should I say repellents? Those are not repellents. They're not chemicals. They may be made up of chemicals, but that's not what's causing the animals to flee. Okay, those are devices. Those are tools. Think of the difference between a hammer and 
sulfur. Okay, a hammer is not, it's made up of chemicals, but it's not used as a chemical. It's used as a device, a tool, where sulfur is used as a chemical. You know, it would be mixed with things to cause a reaction. Okay, so we're talking about chemicals here. Whenever we talk about chemicals, we have to be thinking of FIFRA. Okay, what's that? The fungicide, insecticide. Uh, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, Rodenticide Act, right? FIFRA, that's the national law that governs pesticides. And the EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency, is the agency that regulates pesticides. You may say, well, uh, it's no big deal. It's just XYZ. It's, it's not really a repellent. Then why does it need to be registered? Ah, but it's not true. Let me let me give you the definition of a pesticide as the EPA defines it. And you can find this definition that this is the English version at epa.gov slash pesticide dash registration forward slash about dash pesticide dash registration. Let me read that again. Oh, again, epa.gov forward slash pesticide dash registration forward slash about dash pesticide dash registration. Now, an easier way to find it would simply be EPA pesticide regulations. And that should bring it up for you. Here's their definition. A pesticide is a substance or a mixture of substances intended for preventing or destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. Another part of that definition is any product used as a plant regulator or defoliant is a pesticide or a desiccant. That's a desiccant, something that dries things out. Or anything that's used as a nitrogen stabilizer. I suspect that refers to like fertilizer. Okay, so a pesticide is anything that prevents, destroys, repels, or mitigates any pest. Anything that's used as a plant regulator or defoliant or desiccant. Or anything used as a nitrogen stabilizer. That is the definition of what a pesticide is. If it falls under that category, it's a pesticide. Let me give you an illustration of how, how that definition is so critical. Many of you perhaps have done some fur trapping in the past, or maybe you're doing some wildlife control trapping. Here's, here's how crazy this, this thing is. And this is why legal definitions can drive you nuts sometimes. If you're using fox urine or coyote urine to lure an animal to a set, that's considered a lure. If you're using fox urine, coyote urine, as a way of driving, let's say, a female raccoon out of an attic to take her young with her, that's a repellent. And therefore, it would be regulated under EPA. Same product, same exact thing. The use is what makes it a pesticide. If you use that product as a pesticide, as a repellent, I should say, then it's considered to be a pesticide. Now think about how crazy that is, right? So you're like, well, why does it have to be regulated in one sense? These are some of the crazy things that happen when we deal with the law, but I'm not wanting to deal with it. The reason why I keep bringing it up is I'm hopeful, uh, maybe a foolish hope, but I'm hopeful that if our industry could get organized and aggressive, that we can get the EPA to change some of its rules so that we can use some of these natural products, urine's a natural product, raccoon testicles or natural products to start using them because we would use them as raccoon repellents without having to spend, oh, what, what did I say in my uh, recent podcast, 200, was it $200 million or $7 million to uh, register a new active ingredient? And that's after you discover that it's effective or not. Okay. So it's expensive. All right. So that is what a Pesticides defined as. Now, if you want to look that up in the United States Code, here's where you're going to find it. You're going to look for Title Seven USC, which stands for United States Code. That's the that's the statutes that govern us in America. Title Seven. That's agriculture. Chapter Six, Sub Chapter Two, Section. 136 
you. Now, let me kind of pull that up on the screen for you. Let me just sort of uh, activate my, my screen here. If I could do that, it doesn't look like it's letting me. Oh, that's unfortunate. All right, pulling the screen up here, and you'll notice here's where I'm at. This is you. Let me repeat that. Let me go to the top of the screen for you so you can see this. This is the government in the govinfo.gov. And if you go there to go there and type in and go into section title seven, agriculture. Hope you can see my, my cursor highlighting here. 136 definitions. This should be pretty obvious. This should be pretty obvious for you. All right, let me get my camera straightened out there. Okay, so this is where you'd find it. You scroll down. Let's scroll down together. We're going to go to you. And there it is. There it is in black and white. Now. That is why, so if you need, if you're questioning what I'm saying here about what a pesticide, what a repellent is, is it really a pesticide? And the answer is yes. This is why uh, when we're using products that aren't registered on someone else's property, be careful. Like I tell people when I speak sometimes, don't get caught, right? So you kind of kind of have to work that out there a little bit. I'm not encouraging you to break the law. I think this is one of those things where... The law sometimes has untoward effects, and so just putting it out there, you're going to need to uh, think about whether you're using that. I mean, in some, how crazy this can be, you know, water could be considered repellent, right? So if you spray water at a bird, is that, does that have to be regulated? Well, I would suspect that would be under the minimal risk rule, right? But things can get crazy, right? So I just want you to know this repellents are pesticides and they're regulated by the EPA. So use products that are registered. Okay. That's what you want to do. So now that we've gone, gone through some of that legalese stuff, why do we want to use repellents? Why do people want to use repellents? So let's talk about some of the pros of what repellents are. Again, we're taking a 10,000 foot look here at repellents. I want to do a follow-up podcast and start delving into deer repellents, snake repellents, bird repellents, right? Because I think there's uh, some misinformation out there, unclear information. So I want to delve a little bit more deeply, but right now we're taking a bigger look at repellents. So the beauty of repellents is it avoids killing. As our society becomes more urbanized, and uh, I would suggest pagan, then uh, more and more people don't like killing animals. Okay, so in there, uh, in there are reasons why uh, there's sometimes it may be a protected species that we might want to be careful about, so that we're not allowed to kill it. That would be one reason why we'd want to use repellents, right? So it's not just simply out of an animal rights thing or a rise of paganism. Sometimes there's other reasons, you know, you don't want to, someone doesn't want a certain animal harmed for whatever reason. And they want, they just want the animal to stop doing, doing certain forms of damage. So in that sense, repellent could be very valuable. A third, a second thing is that it can be convenient. So sometimes you, the animals are so numerous that trapping, shooting, toxicants would be uh, burdensome or a substantial risk to non-target species. And in those situations, a repellent would allow you perhaps to reduce the activity of the target species or target animal to stop the behavior or mitigate the behavior that they're involved in without having to do costly and potentially dangerous activities that could get you in trouble with various wildlife laws or neighbors or uh, just untoward problems. So that would be another advantage of repellents. And then the third reason I've thought about, and that is repellents can be a revenue stream for a business. That is because you need to re 
repeatedly apply them. It's not a quote unquote permanent solution, right? So if you continue to apply a repellent and have a service contract, then you have a perpetual money machine that's developed for you. It's sort of like cutting grass, right? I mean, you're cutting grass and every couple of weeks you're coming back and cutting it again, right? So it's same way with repellents. It can be a continued revenue stream for a particular business. So there are some very positive aspects of repellents. Now, let me take a sidebar here and distinguish between a repellent and a flushing agent, okay? So a a, a flushing agent is a subcategory of a repellent. A repellent would have noxious, uh, would be noxious to the animal that experiences the repellent. But a flushing agent has a limited time effect. It's where you're trying to, fl- where you're trying to cause the animal to leave a particular area quickly so that you can find it. Let's say you have um, XYZ animal in a crate, for instance, but it's a small animal and you you don't want to go through the process of taking that whole box apart, uh, pulling all the product out of it per se, but you want to find, you want to confirm that there's that animal's not in that container. Well, a flushing agent would allow you to see put that into the container and see if the animal leaves or stirs or makes a noise. Okay. That would be having a flushing agent, very time limited. It's not, it's not lasting for weeks at a time. It's very quick bang. You're able to get something uh, active there. Right. So that would be a flushing agent. I'm not talking about flushing agents today, but it's always something to keep in the back of your mind. Does this particular product have a flushing capability? Because sometimes repellents may that are maybe sold as repellents are really better understood as flushing agents. Again, it depends on the product that they are. So what are some of the downsides of repellents? Well, there's a lot of them. And this is why repellents often work differently for different people because whenever we're dealing with anecdotal information, we have to, anecdotal is just the story that someone tells you. I tried this and it worked. I tried this and it didn't work. I tried this and I had mixed results. Those are anecdotal stories because no one's sitting there with a controlled research product writing things down. And so let me kind of clue you in on a particular problem that we all struggle with. And that's something that you as professionals need to understand. And that's what's called recency bias. Recency bias is, is that we tend to think the most recent experience is the most true experience because that's the one that brings us most to mind. So if we had a positive uh, experience with doing a particular technique, we're going to be more likely to believe that that technique works. If we've had a recent bad experience with a technique, then we're going to believe that, that technique works. Even if, even though we should have give it the benefit of 20 experiences to see what the average, how it averages out. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But recency bias is something we want to be sure that we avoid whenever we're doing our our thinking about wildlife control or pest control. We want to avoid that particular bias. So the first problem with repellents is the lack of permanency. All repellents are temporary. And the reason for that is is a few things. They all degrade. Chemicals are, are materials or natural materials, whether they're manufactured from a chemical plant or extracted from plant material. It doesn't matter. They're all, everything degrades over time, whether it's potency, whether it's concentration, whether it disappears for whatever reason, maybe it interacts with the environment for whatever reason, it degrades over time. So if you have, so if you need to have a certain percentage of the active ingredient to be present in order to have repellency, once it drops below that, well, then you're really kind of out of luck, aren't you? Another aspect of that lack of permanency is it washes away. So rain, for example, is a significant problem with many repellents, particularly those that are spray that are sprays or powders, because once the rain hits it, the rain can literally lift it up and wash it away and take it away from the location where you originally had it, and it can dilute it down. So it loses its loses its efficacy because the percentage has dropped. Another aspect of lack of permanency 
is that it can be moved. And you say, well, I thought you just talked about that with rain. I'm talking about moved by the plant or it can be moved by uh, wind. If it's a powder. Uh, so let's talk about plant growth. So if there are certain propellants used for Canada geese, for instance, that are applied to the turf and the problem is, is that the grass grows. And so the, part that's been treated is going to be near the top, but the part below it is going to be untreated. Same way with other bushes. You may be applying a, a, a repellent for deer on the bushes, and then if the plant grows, that new growth will be untreated by the repellent. The only way to get around that is what's called a systemic. That is something that's coming in through the roots. It actually goes through the entire plant. Most repellents are not systemics. They're contact or perimeter or area. So repellents suffer from the problem of things move or they dilute uh, or they become washed away. So these are huge problems. But uh, going back to the Canada goose issue, the other issue is that as the grass grows taller, then it gets mowed and the part that was treated gets cut off. So that's why you have to continue to repeat, to re reapply it. The second problem is that repellents can often be bypassed. So here the issue is, is that just because you have a noxious repellent on point A doesn't mean that the animal is just going to sit there and suffer with it. The animal may move, like jump over it. Uh, there's evidence of snakes actually, when they crawl over something that they find irritating, will actually arch their body so that they avoid contact with it. Makes sense. We do this all the time, right? What happens when the wind blows a certain direction? So let's say you have a bad odor, uh, let's say a, a dead skunk. Well, you can be on one side of the dead skunk and not smell anything because the wind's blowing the wrong way. Go on the downwind side and you're going to get a whiff. Same thing happens with repellents, right? So if you're dealing with an, an odorous type repellent, the animal, it may work great, but if the animal comes at it from an upwind direction, now what? So the animal can bypass uh, the repellency factor. Another issue is that sometimes we talked about this earlier, which was the, as the plant grows, for instance, the Part, parts, parts of the plant may be untreated, so the animal may actually select the part of the plant that's untreated. So the no fault of the repellent, right? So if the repellent has been treated part A of the plant, well, the, maybe the animal is going to start eating on part B of the plant that's untreated. This is why application is so critical for proper use of repellent. So sometimes people don't get the results they need with repellents is they fail to apply them correctly. So this is why I tell people over and over again, read the label, read the label, read the label, read the label, and then follow the label, right? We got to follow the label. So this is why it's so important to try to get the mechanics down to proper, because if you don't have even coverage, parts of the plant are not going to be treated properly and the animal can bypass it that way by selecting which part of the plant they're going to be eating. All right, I think that I've covered that. So we have the first issue is lack of permanence. The second issue is that the repellent can be bypassed. The third problem is the resistance. And I don't mean uh, genetic resistance on the part of the animal. I'm talking about a behavioral resistance on the part of the animal. For example, if you're starving... And there's some nasty tasting plants nearby. What are you going to do? Well, most people, and it's been proven historically, when people were in starvation issues, they'd start eating bark. Okay, so when people are starving to death, they will go to incredible lengths to eat things that they have no interest in eating. So this is one of the problems with repellents. That is, if an animal has a like a Sophie's choice, for example, right? Do you, do you starve to death 
or do you eat this nasty food, which barely will keep you alive maybe. And, but you're going to grin and bear and do it. So you're, how are you going to do that? So this is an issue of, for the animal. So no repellent can handle that level of pressure. So this is why when I talk to people about repellents, like for example, deer repellents, I say, look, you, what you want to do is you want to use the repellent and make sure your neighbors don't. Because then you have the issue of choice. Can the animal, can the deer go over to the neighbors and have that nice palatable plants over there that aren't treated? They will avoid your treated plants because the plants over there aren't treated. The problem is, is once their plants have been devastated, they're going to grin and bear it and come back to you, right? So that's part, what's what I mean by resistance. The other issue is, is what if the animal has young in the area. And this is with perimeter repellents. If you're using a perimeter repellent and the animal already had a nest beyond that repellent, what's the, what's the adult animal going to do? Is he just going to abandon his young because there's a noxious odor there or there's something that irritates them? Probably not. I mean, think about, uh, you know, there's a bond between the adult and it's young and they will go to great lengths. It's how they were, it's how they were designed, right? So, and it makes sense because they want to make sure that the, the designer wanted to make sure that animal population would continue. And you'd have to have a pretty high level of, of fidelity to their young, right? So the repellents are only going to be useful if if you're they're used in a situation where the animal's desire to stay or to persevere is less then they're to overcome the noxiousness of that particular repellent. So that's the other problem there. The fourth problem is customer tolerance. Now, this is very ethereal. You may say customer tolerance. If you're dealing with a repellent that's noxious, it may repel, the repel, it may repel your client. Let me just consider mothballs. Mothballs is an active ingredient in various repellent products. It's noxious to us. Uh, and I'm not even talking about the health risks here, okay? So we're just talking about it's noxious. And so if you're using a product that's so noxious, perhaps if your homeowner or your client is very sensitive to that particular product, will they be able to tolerate it? So that has to be part of the mix. It may be a small part of the mix, but that has to be considered as part of the mix. Cost would be part of that tolerance, right? Because if they, if you have to keep re reapplying it and you're charging every visit and there's the cost of the material itself, that can get pricey depending on what you're using. And given the fact that most repellents do not work 100% of the time, even the ones that have been demonstrated to be effective. So will your client tolerate a 70% reduction in damage? My experience has been most homeowners will not tolerate that. Most urbanites, and that's what I call them, urbanites, they demand 100% reduction. If you have clients that don't demand that, then repellents are certainly something for you. But it's something that's got to be part of that equation when you're talking to them. Number five, that's... Does the product actually work? Now, here's the problem. Just because a product is registered with the EPA doesn't mean that the evidence for its efficacy is rock solid. Now, there's going to be evidence for it, but it doesn't mean it's rock solid. By rock solid, I mean where it has a consistent efficacy in a variety of circumstances that you may encounter in your field work. There's a difference between the lab and the world. It's just the reality of it. Does it make the lab bad? No, it doesn't make the lab bad because often you need to test things in a laboratory, a very controlled setting, just to find out if there's any efficacy at all. It's the same reason why when they're doing some, some studies on poisoning, they, and whether cancer, whether something's going to cause cancer, is they give an animal vast quantities, really high concentrations of the pesticide that are going to be far above whatever what any of us would ever be exposed to just to see if it could cause cancer, right? So you're trying to push things to the limit. Same way in the laboratory environment, you're trying to find out, is there any evidence of efficacy at all? Now, 
let me kind of get a little geeky on you here. And this is where we have the problem of research. Okay. There's this issue of called P value. And I, this is something that I've got from Wikipedia here. And I'm going to try to kind of zoom, try to get into this particular area for you. And I want you to focus here on this bell curve. This is your standard bell curve. Now, how observations work is that when they do a study, they usually have what's called a control, and then they have their, their variable your variable study. So for example, if I want to find out if X product repels animals, I will have a, a group of animals that I will use where I'm just using, let's say water. And then to see if water itself will be a repellent or, and then I'll have the product that's being used, the actual active ingredient on another group of animals. And then I will test to see what the differences are. Is there a significant amount of difference between the two groups? And if the d difference between the two groups is greater than the, the risk of chance, then I will, then I will assume that the product is effective. How well it's effective, that's another story, but at least I'll find out that it's effective enough. And that's where we get to a p-value. Typically what it means is if I show that there's a five, only a 5% chance that my results are the result of random activity, then I will believe that the issue is effective. It's complicated. So let me try to give you a concrete illustration. It may come as a surprise to you, but no two experiments are ever identical. You may say, well, you were in high school chemistry class and we were doing experiments. Yes, you all did the same experiment, but all of your results were different. Maybe not radically different, but they weren't identical. There's variableness in the results doesn't mean we don't know anything. It just means that some, some of the people may have done something and the results were dramatically different from other people. Maybe they made a mistake. Maybe they didn't. But there's a, there's a randomness in our observations of nature and in our experiments. So even if someone has a p-value of 5%, that means there's a, still a 5% chance that the results were the result of random chance. Here's an illustration for you. If I have two containers, one container has a mixture of 50% red balls and 50% blue balls. And this container has 50% blue balls and 50% red balls. And I just go over here and pull out 10 balls. And over in this side, I get five blue balls and five red balls. But over in this container, I pull out 10 red balls. Now that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be shocking if I pulled out 10 red balls, even though there were 10 red balls and 10 blue balls that I picked 10 but did you know that, that that's possible? Well, sometimes experiments that are that dramatic are the result of pure chance. That's why scientists often like to repeat experiments to see if they can reconfirm the results. Because sometimes lightning strikes and you get these awesome results that someone else did it and it came out like crap. Why am I telling you all this? Because sometimes... The EPA will register a product maybe with one study. They'll register a repellent with one study. And that study had good results. Don't get me wrong. The study, I'm not saying that there was anything fraudulent going on here. I'm just saying that the study had results that were positive. And the EPA said, yes, we will register the product. You have demonstrated efficacy on that product. The problem is, is that maybe the situation is not what we're going to experience in the field. That it may have worked in the lab, but how often are we dealing with the lab in the field? Let me give an illustration. 
if we're doing, if, if a lot of repellents rely on concentration of odor, well, if the, if the room that you're doing the study in is small, well, then the concentration of the gas or the odor can be much more controlled because you're not dealing with wind. Now, what if we take that same product and put it outdoors? How fast is, is the concentration going to be diluted by a, a simple breeze, just simply by the volume of air all around it? See the difference? Where in a controlled setting, the repellent may have worked great, but in a more real-world setting, the repellent didn't work. So this is why there's sometimes a variance between the research, the lab, and reality. That's why you want to evaluate what kind of research has been done. What was the study like? And is it comparable? How analogous is it to the experience you're going to have in the field? Challenging to say the least, right? Because... Um, it requires work on your part. You know, this is why I'm, you know, in my job here, the Pest Geek Podcast, I'm trying to do some of this research for me, but I want you to be thinking about why am I having a problem with this particular repellent or why am I being successful with this repellent and other people are not being successful with it. Let me give you an illustration. Are you being successful with a repellent simply because you're relying on clients to tell you if it didn't work? Well, that's not a really good way to do it because many, most people will not complain. I'm one of those people. I rarely complain. I just won't buy it again. So I'll work with my dollars. Where when people have, I had one gentleman told, told me a uh, product that he was selling. He had never heard anyone where it didn't work. I talked to a friend of his and he says, I don't use it anymore. It didn't work for me. But he wasn't going to tell his friend that it didn't work right? So this stuff happens. Don't be that person, right? So you want to make sure you understand, try to think about why is something working? Is it really working? Or are you just simply self-deceived? Or do you have actual data that it actually works? Okay. Why does it work? What's the setting? Why did it work in this situation and not in this situation? Is it a different animal? Maybe that animal is just really stubborn. Maybe the animal didn't have a choice. Maybe the animal was sick. Do you see the variables involved? This is why it gets complicated in our understanding about how repellents work. This is why in the reality, in terms of all the work that I've done, I've there's no such thing as a repellent that works every time. Life is simply too complex. Are there some repellents that work incredibly well? Yep. I've seen some research on deer repellents, I think, that hit up to 80%. That's about as high as I saw, if memory serves. About, about beyond that, it's going to be, it's really not going to be that realistic. Okay. But that's just one. Okay. So your situation has, you have to evaluate that. So let me break down again, what that list of problems is, are with repellents. So the first problem, lack of permanence. Remember it washes away, has to get reapplied. Number two, can the animal bypass it? Can the animal's behavior bypass it? Can the environment allow the animal to bypass it? Number three, the problem of resistance. Resistance meaning, can the animal, is the animal motivated to overcome whatever noxious experience it's having with that repellent? Will it grin and bear it? That's what we mean by resistance. Is the animal motivated to go past that? You know, if you have, how, what would you crawl through? Let me give you an illustration. What would you crawl through to get a million dollars? If I put a box, a, a pile of money, what would you crawl through to get it? Think about that from the animal's perspective. Number four, the problem of customer tolerance. How much, how much can they afford? How much irritation can they withstand? And then number five, the problem of does the product actually work and the challenges of understanding the research on it. Went really geeky on you today. I'm really glad that you tried to persevere. Love to get your comments on this. Prepare yourself. I'll be del delving into snake repellents deer repellents, and probably some other repellents if I can get the research on it uh, in upcoming podcasts or vodcasts here. Hope that you find it uh, valuable. If you want to be a sponsor, definitely reach out to me, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. If you have ideas for future shows, you want to give some comments, even some criticisms, yeah, I 
you know, I'll take it. Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Tell your friends. We're trying to build our channel here. We hope you find this to be valuable. And remember, this is the Pest Geek Podcast, living the wildlife. Why? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. I'm Stephen Van Tassel. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs>